What's going on guys? The Ancient Greek here. And today we're going to be talking about the Palmyrene Empire. One of my favorite topics in antiquity. And it happens to be in late antiquity. So it all starts with a Roman emperor named Alexander Severus who died in the year 235. Uh, CE or AD, depending on which one you use. And uh, once Alexander Severus died, the all the generals in the Roman Empire started vying for control over bits and pieces of the empire, and also vying for control over armies. Because you see, by this time, especially this late in the empire most important thing someone could do to achieve ultimate power in the Roman Empire was gain the support of the army. Generals were nothing without their men, and without the love and support of their men, and that was paramount. If a general was well-loved, he was unstoppable in the Roman Empire, unless uh, someone could organize a secret assassination uh, of him, which would most of the time be difficult to do. But aside from that, so at this time, the generals are vying for power and vying for power, and King Shapur I of Persia ends up ends up uh, seeing this as an opportunity to strike at the eastern periphery of the Roman Empire. And so he strikes and fights the Battle of Edessa in 260 AD. And he crushes the Roman forces in a crushing victory. I mean, crushing and decisive victory. And he starts ransacking the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. And a man by the name of Odenathus rises up in the east to counter this threat. He declares himself king of Palmyra and king of Syria. And he rises up and he starts whooping Persian butt like crazy. He just starts killing him. And uh, the fact that this man rose up and declared himself king of Syria and started gathering an army of Palmyrans and Syrians, local Syrians, who had still retained much of their Hellenistic tradition from the prior Seleucid Empire that existed actually pretty much exactly to, uh, exactly, exactly 300 years before. And roughly 300 years before. And uh, this boosted Syrian Hel Hellenistic nationalism in the region and also Syrian Semitic nationalism due to the uh, local adoption of the Syrian Semitic gods by the people of the region. But of course, since Greco Roman paganism was the main uh, religion of the Roman Empire, that was pretty widespread in the province since the province was effectively part of the Roman Empire. And, and, uh, and, uh, in 260, a man who was declared emperor of Rome, a new one, named Valerian, was defeated and captured. And Odenathus defeated Shapur during this time near the Euphrates River in the same year, 260, as Valerian was defeated and captured. And uh, so... 
he also, so a year later, Odinathus uh, uh, begins to have, begins to see some potential usurpers to his throne, and he defeats them all in 261. And uh, once again, he's just kicking a Persian butt. And he is drilling Shapur and pushing him all the way back into the Sassanid Empire and reestablishing the old borders with uh, between the Roman Empire and the Sassanid Empire. And uh, this is a huge, destructive, decisive defeat for the Sassanids. I cannot stress that enough, how much Odinathus kicked Persian butt. But once he uh, does so, and it's over, he, he declares he earns the title more so governor of the east and this is this puts him in a very representative role ruling in the east as kind of a representative of the roman empire and that way he secured uh his tie with the roman empire as a way to kind of uh, safeguard his kingdom from ever going to war with the with the uh, Roman Empire, at least for the time being. We, we know that later on the war will become inevitable, but for the time being he has secured his tie and prevented the war from happening, and during this time Syrian Hellenistic nationalism is rising to an all-time high. So he also takes a chapter out of the Persian book, and I mean the old Achaemenid Empire book, and he declares himself King of Kings in 263 AD. So, uh, he also declares his son Hiran as his co ruler and there is some possible evidence that Hiran had a victory against the Sassanids as well, uh, somewhere by the Orientes River, but we are not sure if that evidence actually uh, points towards Hiran as it could have been somebody else, but if it does point to him, that was one hell of a victory. So, so eventually, uh, as... Odinathus consolidates his power, boosts Syrian Hellenistic nationalism and Semitic nationalism in the region, and just in general, like, raises the prosperity of his uh, newfound kingdom. He is assassinated, supposedly by his cousin, but we're not actually sure about that. He was assassinated along with his son Hiron in 267 AD. So, so, just to recap on this first part, he defeats Shepur near Euphrates in 260, defeats the Usurpers in 261, and declares himself King of Kings in 263, and then he's assassinated in 267. So once he's assassinated, Zenobia steps on to the to the board. Now Zenobia is is going to be the ruler of the Palmyrene Empire, like from the conversion from the Palmyrene Kingdom to the Palmyrene Empire all the way to the eventual end. So Zenobia is a is a very, very interesting figure. And while her husband was alive, it is said that she actually accompanied uh, him on his campaigns, and this would have given her the much-needed, valuable political influence that she's she was going to need after her husband died. And uh, it also would boost the morale of the soldiers, because seeing that the queen was there with them going on all these campaigns. It would have really done a lot for uh, the soldiers' confidence on the battlefield. So, 
So once uh, Zenobia comes onto the throne, uh, it's actually not Zenobia technically coming onto the throne. It's her 10-year-old son by uh, Odinathus named Vabalathus, who is, at, who is coming onto the throne, and she serves as his regent. So, which means she basically has all the power, even though he is the king. But since he's 10 years old, he can't really rule effectively until he grows up. So, uh, she starts off in a very non-lashing out aggressively kind of way. She uh, just secures the borders with Persia and defeats the troublesome Tanu kids in, in a uh, region called Haran, which is actually just to the east of modern-day Israel and on the, in the very, very southern tip portion of uh, Syria, modern-day Syria. So, in that region, the Tanu kids are roaming around and causing their general mischief, uh, trying to establish their dominance over the local population. And she comes down, launches a campaign against them, and defeats them. So, uh, Vabalathus, due to her to her victories, receives the title Persicus Maximus, which means ultimate victor over the Persians, or something to that to that end. So, uh, she also launches a uh, campaigns against Petra and Judea, uh, hoping to gain more territory and strengthen the periphery like buffer, establish uh, stronger periphery and buffer regions for the uh, Palmyrian kingdom. And, and uh, she, she successfully subdues Petra, where the, uh, there was at one point when Antigonus was uh, trying to establish his trying to uh, re-establish Alexander's empire, reunite it, he tried to, he sent Demetrius to try to take Petra, and Demetrius ended up, uh, his son Demetrius ended up having a very long, expensive, and <clears throat> costly campaign, and ended up failing. Well, this time Zenobia actually succeeded, and she took down Petra. So, score one of her Seleucid uh, Seleucid pride. So, Syrian pride. Palmyrian pride. So, also this Palmyrian general named Zabdas comes onto the stage. And this guy will be the chief of the Palmyrian army for the entirety of the existence of the Palmyrian Empire. So this guy is actually going to score some incredible victories in the initial stages of the Palmyrian Empire's expansion. So, finally, they decide to launch a campaign into Egypt, and Zapados goes in to uh, fight this campaign. And the Palmyrans end up annexing Egypt in 270 AD. So, at this point, uh, Palmyra has scored a major, massive, super decisive victory as they have secured the breadbasket of their uh, empire, and they have secured themselves completely food-wise, and so they do not have to worry about having enough food to go around at all and they don't have to worry about like facing any sort of shortages and on top of that they control much more territory in general and it's funny at this point because the Seleucids were dreaming of doing this for so long and the Palmyrans ended up just coming down there and achieving this dream 
pretty easily, which is awesome. So score one again for Seleucid Palmyrene dominance and pride. So, uh, but interesting, interestingly enough, this uh, Roman general, Tenegino Probus, ends up retaking Egypt for a very brief time, but then he's pushed out and he runs away to the fortress of Babylonia where he's hunted down and chased down by Zabdus. And uh, Zabdus besieges the fort and takes takes uh, this Tenegino pretty easily and executes him. So that's the end of any last Roman attempt to reconquer Egypt until much later. So. Then, uh, at this point, with the breadbasket secured, prosperity booming beyond imaginability, and uh, everything just going totally well and totally great for the Palmyrene Empire, uh, so the Palmyrene Empire s shifts their gaze north. Asia Minor at this point, and they go straight into Asia Minor in a spring campaign in the year 271 AD. So Galatia and Amakaira are taken down relatively easily by Zabdos and annexed. They attempt to go further and take Bithynia and the Sisychus Mints, but they end up failing, and that ends up being kind of a crucial failure because that would have definitely done more for their periphery and given uh, Aurelian much more trouble as he comes into the Empire to invade later on. But uh, so Bithynia and the Mints and Sisychus remained beyond the borders of the Palmyrene Empire. So at this point, the Palmyrene Empire has achieved its zenith as far as how uh, far it's going to expand its borders. It will never conquer more territory than it has at this point. So here we are with the Palmyrene Empire this large, encompassing Syria, Judea, uh, Petra, which is basically the modern day region of Palestine, and Egypt and Galatia and Onkaira and all of these territories are consolidated into one incredible state that I am very patriotic for, the Palmyrene Empire. And they never make an official conversion from kingdom to empire, they more so kind of transform into an empire as they start expanding. So because, you know, once a nation start exp starts expanding and uh, conquering other territories, they become an empire, they become imperial at that point. So that is how they basically uh, turned into an empire. So now I'm going to talk about uh, how the Palmyrene Empire boosted their internal prosperity. So Zenobia herself was multilingual. I believe she could speak Egyptian. She could speak uh, Latin. She could speak Greek, I believe. And I think she could also speak Persian, too. So she was a multilingual lingual war. And and uh, the Palmyrene Empire itself was culturally divided into Eastern, Semitic, and Hellenistic zones of culture, but these zones were very friendly with each other, and the Palmyrene Empire uh, declared its main gods to be the uh, Semitic Palmyrene gods. They had their own Semitic gods. I think it was Baal who was one of their chief gods, but of course 
Greco-Roman paganism existed in large swaths, and interestingly, interestingly enough, Zenobia did a very good job in uh, keeping the uh, significant Christian population, especially down in Judea, appeased by uh, giving them rights and uh, giving them a secure territory where they can live and prosper peacefully, economically, and socially without any receiving any sort of discrimination or trouble because she realized how influential and powerful the Christian uh, bishops were in the, the region, in the regions that the Palmyrian Empire controlled. So she did deal with that very nicely. And she became kind of known as a Syrian monarch, a Hellenistic queen, and a Roman empress all at the same time. And this is a very cool and interesting thing, because especially the Hellenistic queen part, that's my favorite. So this is definitely living proof that this was a revival of Seleucid nationalism. It really was. I mean, Syria was the core of the Seleucid Empire, so there's no question. This was a revival of Seleucid nationalism, and I love every bit of it. I, I, I really do. So I'm a huge patriot of the Palmyrian Empire. So, uh, also, Zenobia attracted many academics to her empire. So there would be a lot of uh, scientists and teachers, philosophers, scholars coming in to to uh, the to her courts, and her court she basically turned into a university of sorts where she would conduct like Greek Hellenistic research and study various topics like mathematics and astronomy and all sorts of different things and it would just be a center of flourishing learning and culture. It's really Hellenism at its finest and it's this late. It's, it's this is around like 271, this is 271 AD. Can, can you imagine? It's in flourishing Hellenistic culture. It is really an incredible thing. And uh, it is a huge boost to Hellenistic culture in the region, without a doubt. So, aside from all of the amazing prosperity and boost Hellenistic culture, uh, she began to print coins with Aurelian and Vabalathus on either side. So one side has Aurelian's face, the other side has Vabalathus's face. And the reason why she did, the, and, and you can see on the coin on the Aurelian side, it says Aurelianus Og. And that means Aurelianus Augustus. Augustus. And uh, on the Vabalathus side, it has a special series of letters that essentially means uh, it means like Imperator of of uh, Rome, Imperator of the Roman Eastern Provinces. I believe it roughly means something like that. And Imperator was basically like a, a general governor ruler of a certain region of the Roman Empire, but it was always still under the title Augustus. If you declared somebody Augustus in the Roman Empire, he was the man. He was the emperor on top of everybody else. Even the Caesar was like just somebody underneath him, but the Augustus was man on top, and the Romans loved their Augustus title. If you took that away, if you tried to claim yourself as Augustus, they would get very mad at you. And 
this was a very smart move on the part of Zenobia that she did this because she uh, appeased Aurelian. Now, there is some like questioning about why Aurelian was tolerating this whole thing and why he kind of just went with it. And it could be because he was faking going with it to give Zenobia and Vabalathus a false sense of security to make them think that uh, he was uh, going to always keep everything this way and they wouldn't have to worry about losing their kingdom and in the meantime he was actually preparing for war but uh, or he could have been doing it because uh, he wanted to keep grain supplies coming in from Egypt intact and since Egypt was part of the Palmyrian Empire you know he didn't want to upset them and have grain supplies you know, have basically get embargoed by the Palmyrian Empire, and so, and so uh, he kind of kept tolerance. But really, like the most likely scenario was he was too occupied by barbarians, like Goths and various other Germanic tribes to the west, and also he was occupied by the Gaelic Empire, which was another kingdom that split off from the Roman Empire during this whole crisis of the 3rd century period, and it was being led by Tetricus. And that's another story entirely, and I may be doing another video on that kingdom as well, so hold for that. But, but, uh, yeah, so he was kind of busy with Tetricus and everything going on in the West. And, uh, so he kind of just wanted to secure his eastern flank and deal with Lanagaton, which was smart of, for Aurelian. But, uh, Zenobia, I feel, failed to take advantage of this enough. And you'll see why. Uh, <sighs> after a little while of just experiencing relative, like, boosts in Hellenistic culture and increased like internal economic prosperity without actually securing any more territory or attempting to do anything else militarily. Uh, one year goes by and and uh, Vabalathus and Zenobia have coins with they, they cease production of coins with Vabalathus and Aurelian and they switch over to Vabalathus and Zenobia effectively cutting themselves off, proclaiming Vabalathus Augustus, and Palmyra breaks with Rome. They cut themselves off from the Roman Empire. Now, they probably did this because they, they might have seen that Tetricus was really in trouble by that time, and and uh, war with Aurelian was going to be inevitable. They might have realized that his true intentions were to actually get rid of the Palmyrian kingdom, and he wasn't going the Palmyrian Empire and he wasn't going to uh, tolerate them for much longer. So they probably just saw that war was inevitable, but they should have waited for him to make the move instead of doing it themselves because that way they could have had more time and they also should have taken advantage of the time in a better way, like doing some kind of military reforms or improving the army in some way or expanding into more territory against a uh, various other weaker states that existed around them, so they could have done some more before they made that move, and it would have given them a much better chance against Aurelia, but uh, they didn't do it, and that proved to be kind of a mistake that they decided to go out so early. So, uh, Palmyra breaks with Rome in 272, either way. And uh, they withdraw all their garrisons from Asia Minor, and this is actually perhaps because they wanted to consolidate their forces. So, uh, so they consolidate all their forces, withdraw all their garrisons, Aurelian marches and Asia Minor and starts taking cities one by one and he developed a reputation for completely destroying and sacking and looting every city that he captured, every city that resisted him. 
which is basically every city that he captured. And there's a famous legend with this uh, march through Asia Minor where one city called Tiana, who, or Tiana, who, uh, which was in Asia Minor at the time, was actually spared by Aurelian, and it was like the only city to be spared. And uh, that's kind of an interesting thing that he does, and it's perhaps because there was the, they say it's, the evidence says that there, it is because uh, there was a certain philosopher named Apollodorus, or Apollodonus, and he was from that city, and that city uh, practiced his philosophy. And he just respected that philosopher so much in his work that he decided to spare the city, which is pretty interesting. So then the Battle of Imai happens, and the Battle of Imai is where it all goes down. In the plains outside of Antioch, it all goes down between the army of the Palmyrene Empire and the army of Arena of Rome. So both armies draw up their forces for battle on either side of the field and some skirmishes break out between the two forces like peltists and things and, uh, archers shooting back and forth between each other. So skirmishes break out and Sensing an opportunity for uh, just sensing a feeling of confidence, of victory, an opportunity to crush Aurelian's uh, forces' morale, he sends the famous Palmyrian cataphract cavalry into the battle, uh, straight in, and orders a massive cataphract. Charge. Now, these cavalry are extremely powerful. Aurelian knows this, and he's devised a strategy to turn their strength against him. Because in this battle, before I continue on with the charge, in this battle, Aurelian had two disadvantages. His forces were not accustomed to the heat, and they just endured a long march through Asia Minor. And they were not accustomed to the heat of the uh, region. And also, uh, Aurelian and also uh, Aurelian was faced with the problem of the Palmyrene cataphracts, which, which were extremely powerful. And if they hit Aurelian in the spot, then his army would be annihilated by them and he would lose the battle. And that would be a huge problem, of course, for him. So. He devises a plan to use their to use their uh, his disadvantages against the Palmyrenes, and uh, how he does this is so. Uh, Zabdos, who's commanding the Palmyrene forces in this battle, he he uh, sends the cataphract cavalry into the fight. The cataphracts are charging. Um, Aurelian charges his light cavalry straight into the cataphracts. At the last minute, last like 30 seconds, last minute, right before they were about to hit, they break off and they start running away. The uh, cataphract cavalry of the Palmyrene Empire are so confident that of victory that they just continue the pursuit. Now, light cavalry have no problem running away at a, at a long distance, but cataphract cavalry are very heavy, requires a lot of like force, energy, and power to run that fast and that far, especially chasing down light cavalry, which are faster, and also the heat, so exhaustion. And so the cataphracts continue charging and charging, charging and uh, they eventually get ambushed by Aurelian's forces and uh, pretty much eradicated. And at this point Aurelian has 
<clears throat> essentially secured victory because the Sabados knew that he wasn't going to win since his infantry were no match for the battle-hardened legionnaires of Aurelian's army. So he was forced to call off the battle and retreat his forces. And it was a victory for Aurelian. So that is the Battle of Ime. Now, after this, Aurelian approaches Antioch, and Antioch opens its gates to Aurelian, having no choice, and they kind of surrender in a way to Aurelian, and the whole city is spared, and all its officials are spared. And uh, then they march over to Palmyra and engage forces led by Zenobia outside Palmyra. So, the Battle of Emesa happens at this point. And Emesa looked like it was going to be a Palmyrian victory, so both forces draw up for battle right at the start on either sides of the field, and the infantry engage each other. And the two infantry lines push against each other and fight so furiously. And Aurelian's infantry actually start to break down. And they start breaking and breaking and retreating. And the Palmyrenes are so confident of victory and so happy to see the enemy infantry breaking that they pursue hard and they don't realize that they com they have completely exposed their flanks to Aurelian's cavalry. Aurelian charges his cavalry into their flanks and annihilates the Palmyrene army. Zenobia goes running away on, it is said, the fastest camel in the east. And she runs away to Palmyra, I believe. So the Battle of Emesa is another victory for Aurelian. Palmyra is besieged. Aurelian's forces attempt to break through the defenders a few times. Each time they are beaten back by the defenders, but eventually the city is broken. The defenses are torn down and and uh, they're breached, I should say, and Palmyra is taken. Zenobia is taken prisoner, along, along with Vabalathus, and all the officials in Palmyra are executed. Every single one, and Palmyra is not spared the sacking. So, Palmyra is totally ransacked and plundered at this point, and it is a total disaster, and the ultimate fate of Zenobia and Vabalathus is unknown. It is thought that they could have been brought to uh, Aurelian's triumph and publicly humiliated before being executed, but we're not sure if that's actually true, since there's one account that says that they may have not actually made it to, to the, uh, back to the Italy for Aurelian's triumph. So, it could be true, but it's also, it might not be true. So, ultimately the fate of Zenobia and Vabalathus is unknown, but it's very possible that they were just executed after somehow being publicly humiliated in somewhere, maybe, but ultimately they, pr they were probably just executed. So Palmyra, the Palmyrene Empire, comes to an end, so sad, and it's defeated. And this is truly one of the saddest moments in history for myself, because I, as I said before, I'm a huge patriot of the Palmyrene Empire. I love the Seleucids, I love the Palmyrenes. It's just the Seleucid Empire is my favorite Hellenistic kingdom, and the Palmyrenes 
are my favorite Crisis of the Third Century Kingdom because they are basically the new Silicon Empire. They did so as a general overview. Also, I will and uh, also I will add that to this day Zenobia is a heroic figure in Syria, and she's honored. And uh, in the late 1900s, she was even. Uh, she was even on one of the, like, I think it was, like, tens of thousands of dollar bill notes, bank notes in the series. And she's, I believe they even have a statue of her there. She's honored as a, 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 a heroic figure and a huge figure of Syrian patriotism in Syrian history, so Zenobia has definitely not been forgotten. She never will be. At least not in my heart. So, Palmyra at this point is defeated, and I'll do a general overview on what I think about the defeat of Palmyra and how I think they could have done better. So, at first, first off, they could have, as I said before, uh, waited until Aurelian made the attacking move, and they could have taken that time to actually make some military reforms as well, or something, or secure more, more territory or something. I mean, that's definitely what I would have done. I would have become as powerful as I could, as quick as I could, instead of kind of waiting it out. I mean, it was smart to focus on the interior, but when you've got an enemy like Aurelian, it's smart to focus on military and then focus on, on your interior after you defeat Aurelian. Because Palmyrene Empire could have replaced uh, Rome. But even after they did that, they could have been less overconfident in the battles. They could have been less easy to take the bait that Aurelian was putting out all the time. I mean, those things are kind of obvious in battles, and you know, I know I didn't fare so well against Egypt in this campaign here at the beginning, uh, as you can see, but, but, uh, you know, they could have taken the bait less. And, uh, like in this campaign, the real reason why I kept losing is because Aurelian, uh, not Aurelian, but Egypt, uh, had their cohorts, which were better than my regular uh, Palmyrene legionnaire, legionnaires. And there are Palmyrene cohorts, I just didn't recruit those. I thought the Palmyrene legionnaires would be good, but apparently the cohorts are more heavily armored and, and more powerful, and they kind of broke my... They gave my Palmyrene legionnaires a very hard time, and also the enemy cavalry was just a disaster. And I charged my chariots mistakenly into the uh, Roman skirmisher force, and the Romans took them down with the javelins. So that also ended pretty uh, not good in this campaign. But luckily, Zenobia only gets wounded when she gets taken down, so she didn't actually die right there. That was lucky. I like how she only gets wounded. And, uh, yeah, I just recruit these two mercs here. And take this guy down. So, yeah. This campaign takes a very... Has, took a very interesting turn, and it's going, like, pretty interestingly, so... Please leave likes and comments and subscribe if you like the video and like the content. If you want me to continue playing this campaign that I'm playing in this video, I do plan on making uh, videos that are purely just me playing Rome 2 Total War campaigns with my favorite factions. And uh, I can continue playing this campaign and pick up right where I left off and just like start the series of videos about the Palmarine campaign from there. If 
you guys want me to. So I will definitely do that. So just leave uh, comments about uh, you wanting me to if you want me to. And again, don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the content. So it has been incredible talking about the Palmyrene Empire. It is one of my favorite uh, states existing in history. And I really enjoy talking about it all the time, as much as I can. It has really been a pleasure to share all my knowledge of the Palmyrean Empire with you. And I look forward to sharing more ancient Greek knowledge and ancient Greek related knowledge with you in the future. My next video is going to be about another ancient Greek city that you all are very well aware of and know very well. It's perhaps one of the most popular ones that's ever lived. It is one of the most popular ones that's ever lived and it established its own story. So I'll be doing a history of that all the way from the Neolithic times to the fall. So stay tuned for that series. It'll all be in its own playlist. And I will also continue doing other videos on campaigns, as I said before. So stay tuned for all of that. And I'll be doing videos on other Greek states as well, changing up my workflow and alternating between the different states for the different videos. So it has been my pleasure to present to you the Palmyrene Empire. Have a great time, a great day, and stay safe in these coronavirus times, you Phil Hoines. The Ancient Greek is out. Stay cool.